Sorry? Well, good morning. <coughs> Welcome again to Beyond Ideas of uh, November 2008, uh, and welcome to the session on intellectual property. Uh, my name is Bill Hurley. I'm a faculty member here at the School of Business, and I'm going to give you an overview of intellectual property and why it's important to an entrepreneur. And I'm going to be followed. <coughs> by Jenny Papatolis, who is an attorney, an, a patent attorney with the Reed Smith firm. And she will get into a little more detail about how to protect your invention when you're actually doing the work. It's just going to be an overview. Obviously, in 45 minutes, we can't really uh, get into a lot of detail. But hopefully, we will provide you with the kind of information to at least give you a feel of why intellectual property is of great importance to an entrepreneur. Now, the first slide said uh, intellectual property, and it's actually part of something called intellectual capital. So what is intellectual capital? Well, it's simply intellectual material that can, has been or can be converted into profits, and it's comprised of a number of different things. Intellectual property, collective knowledge in the firm, information, the experiences, the competencies, the relationships, to name a few. And this morning, our sole focus is only going to be parts of intellectual property. On the next slide, you'll see that there are even many parts to that. The most, uh, what we will focus on this morning is things called copyrights, trademarks, and patents. But that's only a few of the things that are in the stable of intellectual property. Other things include patent applications, trade secrets, which could be very important for a company, computer software, proprietary knowledge and know-how, your notebooks and reports, and something called semiconductor photomass. And we, we're not going to talk about any of those things this morning because there's, en there's enough to talk about just with the first three. So let's start with uh, why is this important for entrepreneurs? Anybody have an idea why it might be important? what it can do for you? Well, the one, one is having some intellectual property can, can provide a competitive advantage. And that's what you're really seeking. And it can help prevent others from marketing or producing the product that you have. A second advantage is if you have some intellectual property, specifically patents, or uh, primarily patents, you can use them as a source of licensing revenue. So let's say you come up with something that's patented and other people want to use that invention. You can, get, you can license them to, to use it and get some revenue just from the licensing. And this <clears throat> another important feature is that it increased the value of your company. And this is very important, especially if you're an entrepreneur and you have a little startup company and you're seeking capital. And you want people to invest in you. And if, you, and if they see that you have some very good intellectual property, patents, things like that, it can increase the value of your company, and they may be willing and more uh, uh, inclined to give you some money to get going. And if it's a pretty strong intellectual property uh, stable, they may be willing to give you a lot of money. The second thing is, if you have some of this, it's important for acquisitions. And you can use it, uh, it's its property, you can use it in your negotiating the deal of how much you know, money is trans, uh, uh, transacted. And you can throw in your intellectual property as part of the asset base. And the third, same thing applies for mergers. So it can have a lot of great value for those kinds of things. And it's extremely important for branding. And for you, any of you who have a marketing background, you know, brand, brand names have tremendous value. And by the fact that you have some of these things, trademarks, copyrights, can be extremely valuable. So it has a lot of potential value for companies in general, but especially for entrepreneurs who are just getting started. And it can also be used for what they call bartering and cross-licensing. So if somebody else has a patent that you really need to do your work, to introduce your product, 
uh, you could license it from them. And if you have some license and they be willing, they want your license, um, their pat your patent too, then you can use it to cross license. So you might not, might even get a license without even exchanging money. So what is a copyright? Let's start with that. A copyright, it's the right, a sole right granted by a government, and that's important, government, to a person, a group of people, or an organization to reproduce or sell a book, a piece of music, uh, a work of art, a play, a movie, a, uh, or a presentation that is created. This, this presentation you're getting this morning, by the fact that it's been created, it has a de facto copyright. The copyright is granted as uh, soon as the work is created. Now, you can register a copy for a copyright with the U.S. government. And that's, that's a, like an official notice that if anybody really violates your copyright, you're going to come after them. And so the, and that uh, works copyrighted after 1978 are protected for the life of the creator plus at least seven years, and there's different conditions, but 70 years. After that, the uh, material becomes public domain. So, for example, Shakespeare wrote his plays in the 1400s or 1500s, whatever it was. He's been dead for a long time, and those, that material is now in the public domain. The same is true for, you know, operas that were written a long time ago. If it's beyond these time limitations of public domain, and then anybody can use them. But if you have, say, a current play, I don't know if you know this, and a high school puts on a play, for example, like The Sound of Music, they can't do that free. They have to go to the copyright owner and pay some money to put on that play. So again, it has some value. And the, a registered copyright is indicated by the circle with a, c, a little c, and I think you've all seen that. Now, I'm not an attorney, and I can't address a lot of the stuff that goes on behind it. We do have an attorney here, if any of you have any questions about very specifics. Okay, what's a trademark? A trademark is a name, a symbol, a figure, a letter, you can read that slide, a mark, or any combination that a business uses to designate its, proper, its product or service and distinguish it from others and it must be individually identifiable and distinguishable from uh, those of others offering similar goods and services. Sometimes you might see a trademark used in different areas, and for that to happen, they have to be completely different industries, or it's very e uh, easy to understand. If you're talking about McDonald's plumbing and McDonald's hamburgers, they're two different things. Uh, these are extremely important for the concept of branding, as I mentioned. <coughs> and some examples are, you're all familiar with that Google sign, right? You can't see it from back where there's a little mark up there saying that it's trademarked. What's that one? Rate me immediately recognizable. What's that one? Nike. Nike, obviously. Even this, you can't see it on the slide, that red, that's called Coca-Cola red. <coughs> and that they protect that red, too. Apple, the Energizer Bunny. Now, what do you think that is? Or what's it look like, anyway? It's a Harley, okay. Now, what do you think is, I said these are trademarks. What do you think is trademarked about that? Okay, so anybody else have an idea what's trademarked about that? Somebody's gonna say, yeah? Table. Sometimes I get the little wheel with the wings. That might be. But that's not what I'm trying to do. The sound of the muffler is trademarked. And they protect it. So you, if you hear a Harley coming and you don't know what kind of bike, you can hear it, you can't see it. You hear it coming around the corner, you know that's a, that's a, Hon, I mean that's a, a Harley. It's not a Yamaha or a BMW. So you can protect sounds. And I think a few years ago, they had a case where one Japanese manufacturer was trying to copy that sand, and they took them to court, and they won. Okay, they're usually registered. Trademarks are usually registered. It's indicated by the circle with an R. Or that means it's registered, or a little TM, which is not registered. And there's a thing called a service mark, too, an SM, which you don't see too often. 
But if you have a service business, and it's you know got specific uh, attributes to it, you can you can uh, get a service mark for that. I've never done it, uh, but I know it's possible. And here's some other examples of university, the Villanova University with an R, the Wildcats with a TM, and this one shows a combination. It's Blackberry for all the Blackberries we have. That's registered, and this name here, the way they show it is Blackberry registered. And then Pearl, I guess it's a new model they have, and that's TM, and that's all shown uh, on the product description. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And again, it's the same thing, and we have our turn here. When you, if you start going to suing, there's certain re legal requirements about when you have to have this to go to court and all this, that's correct, yeah. So. I don't know those specifics, but it's not important for you guys to know at the moment. Oh. Somebody say something? Okay. Okay, there's something all called trade dress, which a lot of people haven't heard of. And this is where you have a distinctive non-functional feature, which distinguishes a merchant's uh, goods or services from somebody else's. It's a product that involves the total image and can be used by the color of the packaging, the configuration of the goods, et cetera. The theme of a restaurant might be considered trade dress. They, it's such broad and ambiguous definition makes trade dress uh, very easily to manipulate. And seeking uh, protection against infringements can be vital to the survival of a business. And I'll give you some examples here. The layout of a magazine cover could be trade dress. So if you're walking in the airport and you see Time Magazine on the magazine, you see the red border around it, you can be 30 feet away and still recognize that's Time Magazine. Uh, you can see if you, some of the packaging of frozen foods and everything, bird's eye and things, that could be trade dress. Uh, the shape of an automobile, not from the design point of view of aerodynamics, but from the shape, that can be trade dress. So we all recognize like a VW Bug uh, you can recognize a Corvette or a Porsche. It's just got that distinguishing feature. It's not functional. It's just a distinguishing feature. And then for any golfers in here, the design of a golf hole can be trade dress. So if somebody, you know, Trent Jones who comes up with this fancy hole on Pebble Beach and it's, you know, world acclaimed, they can trade dress that so people can't copy it. So patents, the, the main theme of, is this, of this talk what I really want to focus on. Here it's an exclusive right of a government, the, that the government grants an inventor to exclude others from making, selling, or using an invention for a specific number of years. This is really important. The granting of a patent does not necessarily give the inventor the right to practice his or her invention. So up on the first one it says to exclude others. If you get a patent, you must, and you want to practice it, you want to, you run something called freedom to operate. Because freedom to operate looks around and says, are there any other pa valid patents still in force that may be, you know, telling also about this invention? And a very simple example I use is somebody invents the stone wheel back in caveman time. They got this big, heavy stone wheel, and they patent it. And somebody a few years later said, I don't like pushing that big, heavy wheel around. So they invent the spoke, okay? and they patent a spoke. Well, they can't make a wheel with their spoke if the other patent is still in force because that has the wheel part. So for them to use their spoke, they have to get a license from the wheel, the guy with the stone. And likewise, the guy who invented the stone says, I really like your idea of the spoke. I, I, that makes my wheel lighter, I'd like to do it. Well, he can't do that. He has to get a license from the guy who invented the spoke. So then you could have a cross licensing type of thing. So anyway, a, a lot of times you, it might be surprising to you, but you know I've done some consulting and people tell me how great their patent portfolio is, and I say, well, do you have freedom to operate in all cases? And sometimes they look at me like with a glazed eye, like, what do you mean? It's our patent. I said, I didn't ask you that, you know, so. Okay, in the United States, a patent is granted to the first to invent. In other com countries, it's the uh, first to file is honored. Uh, in the U.S., we have one year to file after commercialization. Uh, stuff a, l a little bit that, you know, I don't know, you're going to get into this. some of that? A little bit, okay. 
There's three kinds of patents. There's something called a utility patent. Could be a composition of matter. So if a drug company invents a new drug, they patent the molecule, state of matter patent. There's another one called a structural mechanical type. You're all, you, you all buy those expensive ink cartridges. They're pretty complicated. They have a function capability. So something like that can be patented. Uh, a process patent, textile weaver, waving, wafer manufacturer. <clears throat> you have combinations of materials, which are recipes and formulas. A design patent is something, it's like the visible shape or design of an object. Uh, for example, if these were sunglasses, the sun you know, glass frame could be patented. Original Coke bottle, uh, I always forget to bring that, but it's a great example for intellectual property because the original Coke bottle was patented, the shape. The material inside is a trade secret, and they have the trademark for Coca-Cola. So this is a good example. An ergonomic keyboard can be uh, patented, that's a design one. Then you have a plant where a discovery and production from seeds uh, gives you a new kind of a plant. <laughs> then there's two specialty categories. One is called a, well, software code and format can be patented. Sometimes companies elect not to because when you get a patent, you're exposing, you're teaching what your uh, code is. And then you have a, call, a thing called a business method patent, investment systems, insurance schemes, uh, e-commerce systems, and things like that. These have been around for a long time, but in the past 10 years, they have become really popular. In fact, the U.S. Patent, over, uh, patent uh, Office is overloaded with them. They have a tremendous backlog. The one-click system for Amazon is a business process patent. So get a patent, what do you need to do? So it has to, uh, to be patentable has to have three uh, <coughs> properties. One has to be novel, can't have been done or thought of before. It has to be useful, has some utility. And it has to be what they call non-obvious to one skilled in the art. So if you take, say, a mechanical engineer and you give it to him and say, well, any, any mechanical engineer would know if you took this particular technology, you could do that. Well, sometimes you get into bitter arguments saying, well, it's really not that obvious because it took 87 years for somebody to figure out how to do this, even though this prior art out there existed. So uh, it, you get into what the examiners start looking at this, the examiners at the U.S. Patent Office. Uh, ownership. Ownership is uh, granted to the inventor. So when you file a patent in the U.S. patent or a poor patent, the inventor is the one who's making the application. However, the inventors may assign ownership to the patent to another, and it's usually done to your employer. So if you go with a big company or even a small company, uh, often you are required to say anything you do while under the company's employ, uh, any patent be belongs to the company. Even though you might be the inventor, you're signing it to the company. Uh, the inventor may license some or all of the rights to another, uh, and that could be an application for a patent to another. <coughs> and then the third thing was, the thing I want, last thing I want to talk about, is what if you decide not to patent? Well, you might decide to keep something a trade secret, but another uh, ploy is that you would do what you call a defensive publication. Remember I said it has to be novel for something to get patented. Well, if, you, if it is published, say your technology is published, then it's out to the public. So if somebody at a year later comes along and says, this, I've made this invention and goes for a patent, somebody can point to this publication and say, this has been published. A publication can also inadvertently happen by speaking at a conference. So there's, you have to be very careful when you're talking about your technology to keep it out of the public domain. But you may elect to make it public on purpose, and that's called a defensive publication. Uh, in the past, before they had the web, people would publish stuff in some obscure journal, the Journal of South African, uh, you know, ores and gold something. Uh, now, with the web, you can do that. There's even a website that's possible called www.ip.com, where you can publish these kinds of things. And once it's published, then it makes it... Uh, almost impossible to get a patent. So that's my quick run through. But again, 
to sum up, intellectual property can be very, very valuable to an entrepreneur person starting up a business. And it's, it's an asset that you really want to look at if you're doing it. Any other, well, we'll have time for questions at the end. So I'm going to now introduce Jenny. Okay, 